Tirakrita, Tirakrita, being defamed. Vipralabdha, being cheated. Saptaha, being cursed. Kshiptaha, disturbed by negligence. Pataha, or even being killed. Api, also. Na, never. Asya, for all these acts. Tat, them. <clears throat> Pratikurvanti, counteract. Tat, the Lord's. Bhaktaha, devotees. Prabhava, powerful. Api, although, he, certainly. Translation, the devotees of the Lord are so forbearing that even though they are defamed, cheated, cursed, disturbed, neglected, or even killed, they are never inclined to avenge themselves. Please repeat. The devotees of the Lord are so forbearing that even though they are defamed, cheated, cursed, disturbed, neglected, or even killed, they are never inclined to avenge themselves. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Shri Prabhupada. The Rishi Samika also knew that the Lord does not forgive a person who has committed an offense at the feet of a devotee. The Lord can only give direction to take shelter of the devotee. He thought within himself that if Maharaj Prikshit would counter curse the boy, he might be saved. But he knew also that a pure devotee is callous about worldly advantages and reverses. As such, the devotees are never inclined to counteract personal defamation, curses, negligence, etc. As far as such things are concerned, in personal affairs, the devotees does not, do not care for them. But in the case of being performed against the Lord and his devotees, then the devotees take very strong action. It was a personal affair, and therefore Samikarishi knew that the king would not take counteraction. Thus, there was no alternative than to place an appeal to the Lord for the immature boy. It is not that only the brahmanas are powerful enough to award curses or blessings upon the subordinates. The devotee of the Lord, even though he may not be a brahmana, is more powerful than a brahmana. But a powerful devotee never misuses the power for personal benefit. Whatever power the devotee may have is always utilized in service toward the Lord and his devotees only. Translation again. The devotees of the Lord are so forbearing that even though they are defamed, cheated, cursed, disturbed, neglected, or even killed, they are never inclined to avenge themselves. <clears throat> Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gananjala Shalakaya Chakshuru Militam Gena Tasmai Sri Guru Venamah Sri Chitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Janabhutale Svayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svapadam Nikam Jaya Sri Krishna Chitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Arvete Garadar Shiva Sadi Gauru Bhakta Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hari Hari. I'd like to welcome our guests. You've been here before? First time? 
Okay. Are you familiar with this this book? I'm gonna re I'm gonna recap a little bit, just to give you a sense of the story here. Past time. Um, actually, we're we're nearing the end. There's just a couple of more verses till the end of this chapter. As we all know, the Bhagavatam is a conversation between Parikshit Maharaj, who is the grandson of Arjuna, and Sukadeva Goswami, who is the son of Yasudev. There's a conversation taking place. And present, present during this conversation was a great sage named Sutta Goswami. And he was speaking to the sages of Naimisharanya. They were there performing the sacrifice which was to last for like a thousand years. And in the beginning of this chapter, uh, Parikshit is summarizing, I mean, uh, Sutta Goswami is summarizing the glories of Parikshit. Uh, how in the beginning, at his birth, he was protected simply by the mercy of the Supreme Lord. He was protected within the womb of his mother when a Brahmastra weapon was sent by the son of Dronacharya, Ashvatam, right? And then uh, because he was consciously surrendered, always thinking of the Lord, fully surrendered. There was no fear. He had no fear of what was about to happen in his life, that uh, he was cursed by this Brahmin boy. He was to be cursed by this Brahmin boy and, and then uh, die, uh, bit by a snake bird, right? So then, uh, <clears throat> so he left. He would leave home leave behind his kingdom and become a disciple of uh, Sukadeva Swami and become firmly fixed in understanding the position of the Supreme Lord Krishna. It's mentioned here in this in one beautiful verse that uh, <clears throat> uh, in this way by dedicating oneself to the transcendental topics of the Supreme Personality of Godhead um, one does not risk uh, any um, mis, uh, misinterpretations. See, that's not the word being used. Let me see what that word is. <clears throat> it's a very important verse, I thought, was... They do not run the risk of having misconceptions even at the last moment of their lives. So that was his situation. He was going to die in seven days. So to hear about the transcendental topics of Lord Krishna, this would um, shield him from such misconceptions at the time of death. <clears throat> now the age of Kali, as long as Parikshit Maharaj ruled, Kali would not have much influence. And uh, Lord Krishna had departed from the world and Kali had made his entrance. But even though it had made its entrance into this world, Parikshit understood that only, only the unintelligent would have fear of Kali, but that those who were self-controlled would have no fear. And uh, it was his responsibility to see that those who were foolish and careless, that uh, he, would, he would be there to rectify the situation. So this was as much as he had told the sages and uh, concluded by saying that if one is really serious about perfecting one's life, one should submissively hear about the topics of the Supreme Lord. This was the conclusion of his statements to the, to the sages. So the sages answered, uh, so the sages responded by saying, may you live a long life, Sutta. May, you, may your fame be eternal because you have you've been telling us, uh, the, you're giving us the greatest nectar. And uh, they wanted to hear more. They'd been performing the sacrifice, but it was full of smoke. There was so many faults in the sacrifice but uh, hearing about these nectarian pastimes, they became, uh, they became very enlivened. And uh, 
even stated that a moment's association with a devotee can't even be compared to attaining the heavenly planets or liberation, what to speak of all the material benedictions we may get in this world. These benedictions are, are for those who are subjected to death anyway, so all these benedictions will die with the bodies. And uh, <clears throat> so they urged Maharaj Prikshit, or, uh, they urged Sukh uh, Sutta Goswami to speak more about uh, what did Parikshit hear? What was it that he heard? And um, all, what took place? I mean, all, all in relationship with Lord Krishna. And uh, so Sutta Goswami re replied saying that he, he was humbled and uh, said, you know, I've come from a low birth, lower birth. But by associating with great souls and hearing this transcendental knowledge, I've become purified. What to speak of those who constantly hear these topics. And uh, <clears throat> so he said, but I can only speak on these pastimes to the extent of my realizations. This is an important point. But unless one has some degree of realization, then we, it's very difficult to speak of spiritual topics. <clears throat> so Parikshit, um, Parikshit's pastimes begins at this point, um, or at least the, uh, the, the beginning to hearing from Sukadeva Goswami was all set through this incident that took place. So Sutta Goswami begins by saying that Parikshit he was out hunting one day, and he became very tired and, hun and hungry and very, uh, very thirsty, and he was looking for a reservoir of water. And he came upon the, the, uh, the ashram of this great sage, Samika Rishi. And the sage was in meditation. He was exhibiting these um, symptoms of being in trance. And Parikshit approached him and asked him for water, and the sage didn't respond. So, <clears throat> naturally, Parikshit, being an elevated soul, self-realized soul, would have understood that the sage is in trance and so on. So it was really Krishna's arrangement that Parikshit became over, overcome with, with some anger. And uh, he took offense at the sage neglecting him. And when Parikshit was leaving, he put a dead snake on his shoulder. Well, meanwhile, at a distance, the, the son of the sage, Samiki, uh, his young Brahmin boy named Shringi, somehow or other he came to hear of this and became very angry. And immediately, he, he, he was actually very powerful because he was trained as a young boy. And uh, he cursed Parikshit to die in seven days to be bit by a snake. <clears throat> And then the young boy went back to the, to the ashram and saw his father. And when he saw the snake on his father's shoulder, he started to cry. And his father came out. But the boy had cursed Parikshit, such an exalted soul. Then the father became very distressed. He says, my boy, you foolish boy. He says, you don't realize that the king is a representative of the Supreme Lord. <clears throat> and uh, without the king... Uh, this whole system of monarchy will fall apart and the, the citizens will be exposed to plunderers who will take their wealth, steal the animals and steal the women. And then the whole system of Varnashram, the system of caste and orders of society will, will, will be demolished and people will not be engaged properly in their, in their, progressive, their progressive march to spiritualize, you know, spiritual life. All this is a great science. So, so the father was very, very, he, he could see that he actually made the statement is such a harsh, such a harsh curse for such an insignificant offense. Because when the father saw the snake, he, he just threw it off his shoulder and he didn't, he didn't take offense at this. And um, <clears throat> so, um, so he, he told the boy, you should, not have, you should not have cursed the king. And this brings us to verse uh, 47, which was supposed to be yesterday, but they didn't do it. So I'm going to do it today. 
verse 47, then the Rishi prayed to the all-pervading personality of God to pardon his immature boy who had no intelligence and who committed the great sin of cursing a person who was completely free from sin, who was subordinate and who deserved to be protected. So, <clears throat> I won't go through the whole purport, but I explained a few things that I was reading. Um, it's interesting, Prabhupada mentions in the purport that not only was this a sin, but it was a great offense. And I began to wonder, well, what, what is the difference? <laughs> there's a sin committed, but also a great offense. And there's no, no elaboration on that point. But um, in the Bhagavad Gita, we hear of sin in, in the third chapter when it says that the, the demigods, they're in charge of various necessities of life. So to accept these gifts without offering them in return to the demigods, this is considered sinful, right? So it's an example. So sin can be counteracted by pious activity. But in the case of the greatest offense, which Prabhupada mentions, it was a sin, but it was the greatest offense. The greatest offense being mentioned here is that the boy cursed a pure devotee. So this is considered uh, a, a great, great offense. And, and for such an insignificant offense on the part of Parikshit Maharaj. <coughs> Sometimes the Brahmana may deal harshly with Kshatriyas and Vaishyas. Generally speaking, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and so on are under the protection of the Brahmanas. Mm -hmm. They care for them and uh, providing spiritual guidance. There are some exceptional cases. We have the story of King, King Vena, who was a cruel king. And somehow or other, even though the Brahmanas had appointed him as a king, um, after some time they realized that we got to do away with him. He's terrorizing everybody, killing people unnecessarily. And uh, <clears throat> so he was killed. But even though he was a um, unqualified king, to some extent, he could prevent plunderers and thieves from creating havoc in society. Um, although he contributed to much greater havoc. So here in this case, the father was telling the boy, when, you, when a responsible king like him is, is, is being you know, put into this situation and the whole system will suffer and uh, he, he makes these, these statements that the, the society at large will be exposed to rogues and thieves. Society will not be protected. We don't have to look very far to see examples of that in our society today. <clears throat> so, of course, this was not an ordinary exchange. Here we have a young boy. We could say, well, okay, he's a Brahmana, but he was just a boy. And although he was very powerful. And Srila Prabhupada even makes a point here, I'll, I'll read this, that a question may be raised herein that since it was the desire of the Lord that Parikshit Maharaj be put into that awkward position so that he might be delivered from material existence then why was a Brahmana's son made responsible for this offensive act? Hmm? Why was a Brahmana's son be made, be made responsible for this act? Pardon me? Why would he do that? Yeah. And why choose a, Brahm why choose a Brahmana's son to do that? Brahmana, for one thing, and then his son. 
Prabhupada gives the answer. He says, the answer is that the offensive act was performed by a child. Uh, only so that he could be excused very easily. And thus the prayer of the father was accepted. That's in the next verse. The father, actually a couple of verses, father prays. And uh, so again, we think, you know, it was not ordinary. This is slight offense. And in such a big reaction, the entrance of Kali, <laughs> the whole, whole society suffered as a result of this one small incident. And this reminds me actually of a, a, uh, an exchange that took place between Srila Prabhupada and some of his disciples. I read that in a, a Back to Godhead, Srila Prabhupada speaks out. And it's in reference to um, sometimes uh, Christians would, would, would uh, try to justify uh, eating meat. And uh, so <clears throat> this, this illustrates how the, um, the response, the, the, the response that... Christians give uh, is sometimes not, uh, how would you say, proportionate to 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 the to the, to the you know the reason. So they don't. People Christians can eat meat, and they say Jesus Christ ate fish. Okay, so she, the disciples brought this to Shri Prabhupada, but Christ ate fish. Shri Prabhupada didn't even argue the point whether he ate fish or not. He simply said, using a Bengali uh, saying, you know, you know that saying? He said, oh, there's a mosquito. Quick, get a cannon. You see? In other words, okay, so Christ ate fish. So does that give you the right now to open slaughterhouses and have wholesale slaughter of animals and continue with this meat eating and like this, you see? So it was not proportionate. So in the same way, here the, the offense, uh, the, um, the response that the Brahmin boy gave in, 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 re in regards to the offense was not proportionate. It is also actually extremely unproportionate. So it was an indication that this was Krishna's arrangement. The child was involved. The father was involved, and Parikshit Maharaj was involved in allowing Kali Yuga to, to make its entrance. <clears throat> in this way, the Brahminical culture was weakened, and as a result of that, the Kshatriya had no spiritual direction, the principles of religion would be weakened, and the Kshatriyas would now, uh, would later on, uh, take advantage of their positions without guidance and counsel, and uh, you know, you lose the arms, you lose the legs, I mean you lose the arms and you lose the head, what's left. And Prabhupada even makes the statements, what happens is when this society um, loses its, its uh, the Brahminical and the, and the, the uh, qualitative Kshatriyas, qualified Kshatriyas, then people are just preoccupied in economic development mentioned in that. Actually, it's not Prabhupada. It's a, it's a verse. It's part of the verse. Verse 45. At that time, the people in general will fall systematically from the path of a progressive civilization in respect to the qualitative engagements of castes and orders of society and the Vedic injunctions. Thus, they will be more attracted to economic development for sense gratification. And as a result, there will be unwanted population on the level of dogs and monkeys. So, <clears throat> getting back to today's verse, the devotees of the Lord are so forbearing that even though they are defamed, cheated, cursed, disturbed, neglected, or even killed, 
They are never inclined to avenge themselves. <clears throat> um, I can speak from personal experience <laughs> when, uh, when there is, you know, when my name is put into question, then it becomes a very disturbing situation. You know, oh, how I look, you know, the image that I might project, if that's, uh, <clears throat> you know, being exposed for some wrongdoings, it's difficult to accept. And the false eagle comes up. I just had an incident the other day or something about, with good intentions I had done something, and then I was chastised for, for doing it. <laughs> and uh, so my immediate response was to, you know, to kind of like fight back. Okay, to chill out, you know. <clears throat> so, easier said than done to be remain equipoised. So many verses in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is reminding us, uh, for one who's controlled the mind, the super soul is already reached, for he has attained tranquility. To such a man, happiness, distress, uh, heat, cold, honor, and dishonor are all the same. Those whose mind are established in sameness and equanimity have conquered the condition of birth and death. If the mind is established, uh, rises above the dualities, like Krishna tells Arjuna, rise above these dualities, be, uh, be situated in the self, be free from all anxieties, from all gains for happiness and distress, be established in the self. You know, so that state, obviously, Parikshit had realized that state of being. And uh, when he heard that he was going to die, he accepted it. Uh, <clears throat> so one may question, well, when's the time when one can challenge a curse? Prabhupada gives that answer in the purport that if if the Lord, the Lord's mission, the Lord's devotees are being uh, threatened, blasphemed, then the devotee will come forward and, uh, and, and, and challenge the wrongdoer. There is a beautiful story. I'll just make it brief here, maybe end, end with this story. Um, Krishna can make an exception to that rule in terms of protecting one's image <laughs> because Krishna is after all the goal understanding and loving Krishna is the goal so therefore Krishna's image must at all times be uh, protected and Krishna himself had to do it one time there was a story where uh, there was a king Satrajit and he had this this jewel given to him by the sun god. And this jewel would, would, uh, would produce so much amount, so many amount of gold daily, <clears throat> large amounts of gold daily. Somehow or other, the uh, Krishna wanted this jewel to go into the possession of King Ugarasen. But Satarajit was attached to it. And one day, the jewel disappeared. And it was Satarajit's brother who took it and he went off, disappeared, and Satrajit started to accuse Krishna because he knew that Krishna wanted Satrajit to give it to Ugrasen. <clears throat> so Krishna's good name was being tarnished. So Krishna decided to rectify that. And he says, I will, I will go and find out what happened. And of course, we probably heard the story before he he set out to find the jewel. He found Satrajit's brother had been killed by a lion, and the lion had been killed by a bear. And then he found the bear, and that was Jambavan, and so on. So anyways, so then he came back with the jewel and then offered it back to Satrajit and cleared his name. <clears throat> so it is Krishna's name that we wish to honor, Krishna's devotees, and Krishna's mission and we are given 
uh, beautiful, beautiful pastime here to show how uh, even though it's the age of Kali, uh, it's a very difficult times, especially in the times we're living in right now, uh, actually we have a greater opportunity to be reminded how important it is to be hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and also sharing it with others. So thank you for coming and uh, I'm going to stop here if there are any comments and questions. <coughs> Our guest is saying that we covered some points that he had not heard before, and uh, we appreciate you for uh, for your attention on that. Matura, you had a question, comment? So the question is in reference to how we can <clears throat> become purified to be able to confront uh, those who are dishonoring uh, <coughs> Krishna, his movement, and so on. And that the remedy, one of the remedies is actually through chanting, chanting properly with, uh, with attention. And if not, then our chanting will be subjected to to uh, the modes of nature and uh, diminish in, in potency. That's I don't know if that's <clears throat> if that's the question basically you're asking or commenting on that. Um, of course, there's yeah different stages of purity and chanting. <clears throat> And uh, the quality of our chanting, <clears throat> um, the holy name is never, actually I was just thinking of a verse I was reading the other day that in one sense, the holy name is never subjected to the modes of nature, right? Chris Lord Chaitanya says there are hundreds and millions of names, the holy name uh, is not subjected to rules and regulations. It is not the holy name. The holy name is, is, is can't be affected by any, by place, circumstance, or time. But it is us. We are subjected to the modes of nature. We are subjected to time, place, and circumstance. So our appreciation of the holy name <coughs> Uh, will depend very much on guidelines that are being offered in order to make a suitable environment so that we can clean away, clear away the dust. Of course, the holy names, by chanting the holy name, it clears the dust. It's reciprocal. Krishna is a person. Krishna reciprocates. Krishna helps. But we're not impersonalists. Um, <clears throat> it's not all one, it's not uh, anything goes type of philosophy that, oh, just chant Hare Krishna, everything will be fine, and uh, we don't have any, uh, we don't have to apply ourselves in doing our daily exercises. Everything can be used in Krishna's service. But we have specific, specific foundational guidelines and they vary, in, they vary in importance. 
So <clears throat> chanting, of course, chanting the holy name is the, the, the prime requisite. The specific amount of time, specific a number of chanting is, is, the, uh, is the instruction given by Srila Prabhupada. Actually, his instruction was to chant even more, but eventually he was, uh, told his disciples 16 rounds, approximately two hours daily of chanting. So, yeah, we should never under, underestimate this instruction and think we can substitute it with other instructions. And <clears throat> You're visiting from where? Charlotte, North Carolina. You specifically came here to Nice. Mother Malati. Public service announcement. Today, July fifth. Six. In nineteen sixty six in New York City. The International Society for Krishna Consciousness was formally incorporated. And the name was determined by Srila Prabhupada. Yijai. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> One person said, well, why not the International Society for God Consciousness? And Prabhupada was very firm and adamant that we say the name Krishna. Mm -hmm. and, uh, how many trustees were there? Just curious. Eleven trustees. <laughs> that was practically everybody that was... <laughs> And I, I, I believe that there was one one person, I don't know if it was the lawyer, who, and Srila Prabhupada asked him for a donation, or or the person who was renting it, and he made him a trustee. Is that is that correct? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So we have a. Uh, a few few more minutes. I'm going to read the uh, the last paragraph. Of the uh, verse forty seven, <clears throat> we we were we were speaking about uh, the questions that Shri Prabhupada raised and why choose a Brahmin's son to cause this, and of course. It was just the boy, so it was easy to forgive him, and the, the father's prayer would be answered. And then Prabhupada brings up another question. It would be interesting to look into the details of this matter. Um, but if the question is raised why the Brahmana community as a whole was made responsible for allowing Kali into the world affairs, again, another pastime. The answer is given in the Varaha Purana that the demons who acted inimically toward the personality of Godhead but were not killed by the Lord, uh, those who were killed by the Lord, they were liberated. But those who were not killed by the Lord, they were allowed to take birth in the family of Brahmanas to take advantage of the age of Kali. Now, it goes two ways here. The all-merciful Lord gave them a chance to have their births in families of pious brahmanas. Okay, these guys were kshatriyas. <laughs> they fought when Krishna was there. They were demonic kings. They fought, but because they were fighting in this very, you could say, auspicious battle, <laughs> they, they, they were elevated. 
to become Brahmins. Now, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, if the unsuccessful yogi, after many years of enjoyment in the planets of pious living beings, can take birth in a family of righteous people or in the in rich aristocracy. So they became brahmanas and they could progress towards salvation. However, these demons, instead of utilizing the good opportunity, misused the brahminical culture due to being puffed up by vanity and becoming brahmanas. The typical example is the son of Shamika Rishi. And all the foolish sons of Brahmanas are warned hereby not to become as foolish as Shringi and be always on guard against the demonic qualities which they had in their previous births. The foolish boy was, of course, excused by the Lord, but others may not have a father like Shamika Rishi. Krishna excused uh, the boy because Shamika was a great soul also. But <clears throat> those who do not, those who are foolish, they will be put into great difficulty if they misuse the advantage obtained by birth in the Brahmin family. And in the case of Maharaj Prichit, who was he was a Kshatriya, so we could say, well, the Kshatriya is not as powerful as the Brahmana, but Pariksit was a devotee. And Prabhupada explains, it is not that only the Brahmanas are powerful enough to award curses or blessings upon the subordinates. The devotee of the Lord, even though he may not be a Brahmana, is more powerful than the Brahmana. Why is that? Why is a devotee more powerful than a Brahmana? Servant of the most powerful. Yeah. We have so many incredible stories. Durvasa Muni, who offended Ambarish Maharaj. And Krishna came to his rescue. Ambarish wasn't asking for it. But Krishna will not tolerate his devotee being offended. Krishna didn't tolerate Prahlad Maharaj being uh, <clears throat> persecuted by his father. So the devotee of the Lord, even though he may not be a Brahmana, is more powerful than a Brahmana. But a powerful devotee never misuses the power for personal benefit. Whatever power the devotee may have is always utilized in service towards the Lord and his devotees only. So, as I mentioned, we got two more verses, and this will be the end of this, this chapter. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to all the devotees of the Lord.